I'm really delighted to have our, our three guest panelists here um, from industry. And I know from last year's session how very much um, delegates welcomed um, the participation of our industry colleagues and hearing from them about their experiences of research, development, and innovation, particularly with the, the third level. As Connor said, that's, that's the topic of this session. What I'm going to do is I'm going to hand over to our three panelists. I'll be asking each of them to give you a little bit of background about where they're from and the kinds of interactions that they've had uh, with our institutes here. Um, and then after they've each spoken, we'll go into the, the, the a conversational format with them. I'll tease out what I think are some interesting points. Um, and then there'll be opportunity for questions from the floor when you can ask the points that you really think are interesting. So if we could kick off with you, Killian. Thanks again, Alison. Um, there have been some great speakers here today, and unfortunately, I'm going to lower the standards, so uh, sorry about that in advance. I'm not used to being on the stage up here, um, so please forgive the notes, um, and particularly the lights here. It's all, uh, it's all been starstruck here a bit. Um, I'd just like to share my uh, perspective and experiences uh, being a small business collaborating with Dublin Institute of Technology. And firstly, I want to say, I have to honestly say I'm continually stunned by the high level of talent and uh, world-class expertise that's in our colleges and universities here in Ireland. And my company, uh, PE Services, genuinely is privileged to, to work with DIT Hothouse and DIT Agricultural Analytics Research Group. So I'd just like to recognise uh, Knowledge Transfer Ireland and Enterprise Ireland for being the catalyst for making this uh, collaboration happen. So I just wanted to say that on the outset. Uh, P Services is a small company um, operating along the border in County Cavan. I'm a, I'm a Monaghan man, I just want to make that very clear. <laughs> we employ just over uh, 20 employees and we operate uh, throughout Ireland and into the UK. Um, we're a, an equipment-based uh, solutions providing company and I suppose we have a number of different uh, areas in, in our business. Primarily agriculture, uh, providing um, turnkey solutions in the pig, poultry and dairy sector. And we also have a washing environmental division and we provide services washing everything from trains, trucks to army tanks. So there's quite a range there. And we also have a safety division and we provide um, safe access systems for being able to access the tops of road tankers, particularly for the food and pharma sector. And of course, my favourite my favorite uh, sector are distilleries and breweries. So, uh, so there's a diverse range of products, a diverse range of customers this spreads the risk and I suppose using the poultry analogy we don't like to keep all our eggs in one basket um, in a previous life I was in the banking sector I left the banking sector about uh, 10 years ago and invested in the company and uh, within a couple of months along came the recession and I quickly realized that there were more than two certainties in life those of death and taxes there was a third and that was uncertainty um, but we wanted to put a positive slant on that and we call it change. So over the last 10 years, I suppose we've become more and more um, accepting of change and particularly over the last while, none of us expected Brexit, none of us expected Mr. Trump and it appears the world is continually looking for change. And I suppose we've learned the same or I've learned the same from my customers' needs that they're constantly changing. And uh, I suppose our strength as a business um, is our industry knowledge and our ability to adapt and change and provide customers with uh, tailored solutions. So change is very much part of that. Um, and it became very clear very quickly uh, the huge importance of technology and particularly in the farming sector. Uh, there's been a greater dependence on um, automation and information and particularly in the poultry sector within Ireland and, and worldwide. Um, and I suppose PE services, we supply computer systems as well as other equipment into the um, poultry sector and the systems we provide control everything from ventilation, feeding, temperature, um, water, so there are various sensors throughout the poultry unit that provide a huge amount of data into these computers and the data that are on the computers are sitting there and the data is not being used. So we've seen a need that we needed to translate this data and to turn it into usable information for the farmer so that the farmer can make real-time um, real decisions. So as well as that, we also seen that there was a huge competition in our day-to-day -day business, and this was increasingly putting pressure on margins. So it was very important that the company would look 
towards having a competitive advantage in the future over our competitors and, and try and find a way that would provide uh, better margins and help develop overseas markets and, and, and I suppose develop a stronger business structure for the, for the future. Um, and I believed, I suppose, uh, in combining things that we were good at with technology and that this would make us more resilient to economic cycles and other challenges that might come our way. So being a small company with limited resources and in terms of money and skilled people, uh, it's impossible to embark on any product development on your own. So think small, be small, think big, be big was applied to our thinking. And I knew that there was a huge demand for data-driven technology through various poultry experts that we would have interacted with, uh, such as the Carton Group and other international companies that we would deal with. And as a result, we developed a farm of the future concept. And basically, this was involved controlling all and measuring all the inputs and variables into a farm, and with the aim of improving animal welfare, better food production, and more profitability, and essentially it's precision farming. So, Initial inquiries um, were made and uh, I, I wanted to try and find out could, how could I move this on and I became aware of the Innovation and Competitive Enterprises uh, or the ICE program as it was known and this program helped companies scope out new technologies and innovations relating to their businesses and it was led by uh, Malachi Mooney and Kieran Fagan, Kieran's here today, I promise I'd mention him, uh, who is in the Dundalk Institute of Technology, and they were excellent in helping us to scope out the need and find a, a, a potential solution to, the, to what the, the problem that we were trying to resolve. And this kept us commercially focused in relation to what we were, were looking to do. So from there, the, the, the Vital program, which we embarked on as well, was a lead on from the ICE program, and it helped match companies to new technology and uh, new opportunities to enable growth. We completed a feasibility study, which was grant funded through that particular program in relation to the specific technology, and we discovered that there was no other product available worldwide for what we were looking at doing. So uh, through the Vital program, we were very lucky that uh, Vital, being with Dundalk Institute of Technology, there was a network there, and we were introduced to DIT Hothouse and to Kieran O'Connell. Um, DIT housed the School of Computing and are experts in data analytics. And uh, I was introduced to Dr. Robert Ross, and he leads the Agricultural Analytic Research Group. Um, and I suppose, to be very honest, I was very skeptical at the start that a college in Dublin City how could they help chicken farmers in Cavan and Monaghan? So uh, I met with Kieran and Robert with a very open mind, and uh, I suppose after the first meeting, I was very confident that they were the right academic partners. Um, Kieran's from a farming and a business background, and Robert is an expert in data analytics, and I knew these two combined were very important and a good match for us because that's where we were coming from as well. Um, Kieran also won me over in terms of something that, was, uh, that struck a chord with me at the very outset, and uh, it was his definition of innovation, and it was turning ideas into invoices, and this is ultimately what every business needs. Turning good ideas into good products and eventually into sales, at the end of the day, that's what keeps us all going, that's, that's why we exist. So we sat down, we agreed uh, what we wanted to achieve and how we were going to go about it, and everyone had very much clarity of what was to be achieved, and that was, a key, uh, that was a key part of what we started to do initially. Communication and understanding of each party's expectations and abilities and our roles and responsibilities were clearly outlined at the start. Um, Robert Ross uh, completed the innovation partnership application for uh, grant funding with Enterprise Ireland, and with a little bit of help from myself, I have to say Robert took most of the burden, um, and Enterprise Ireland grant funded uh, what we call the Smart Chick project. Uh, this particular technology was a, a data analytics project. Um, it, uh, it won a merit award in the Enterprise Ireland Innovation Arena at the Ploughing in 2015, and uh, we, were, we were delighted that it did that. But following this, I attended a conference in Birmingham, a poultry conference, and um, I discovered that a Belgian company, which from one of our previous speakers was a spin-out from Leuven, um, had already begun to provide a similar technology and uh, um, against our, uh, very similar to our smart chick technology. So it was something that uh, obviously we, um, I was a bit disappointed obviously, but I met with Kieran and Robert and DIT and we all agreed that the technology that we would look at needed to be unique technology and we reconsidered our position or as, as Jeff said earlier on, and I don't like using trendy words, but we, we pivoted. <laughs> so uh, Robert proposed a visualization technology and it was a 24 hour artificial intelligence monitoring system. 
uh, and it was ideal for our sector, uh, for the agricultural sector, um, and it provided ex significant benefits to uh, farmers, to their animals, and to the industry worldwide. So we were looking well beyond the Irish side of things, well beyond Europe and, and further afield. In fact, again, going back to what I said at the start, DIT and, and Robert Ross are at the forefront of this deep learning technology worldwide, and again, it's an indication of the expertise that's present in our third level institutions. And I suppose it's for somebody that's coming from a business perspective and looking in, it's, it's really staggering to see what, what is going on behind, uh, behind uh, the, our, our college doors. Flockguard was born, which is technology that we're working with at the moment. Uh, we submitted a change of project to Enterprise Ireland and after a few weeks we got uh, approval to proceed. Today, thankfully, the project is very well advanced and it's nearing commercialization. We have a test farm in County Monaghan, thanks to the Carton Group, the, the large um, a poultry processor in Shercock County Cavan. And in fact, DIT are actually on farm there today with, with uh, some of the PE services staff. The interaction between DIT and ourselves has been genuinely very, very strong. Um, so I suppose the key to this is the link with DIT Hothouse and Kieran O'Connell. Um, I see that as creating a bridge between the business and the academic experts. And again, we were talking about bridges earlier on, but it, very much that's very important. Um, there's open communication, there's clear goals, and milestones are essential along the whole way. Hothouse has helped, uh, helped my company in all the licensing, the grant applications, and any technical issues that has arisen, has arisen during this particular journey. And I suppose our technology was a finalist again in the innovation arena and the ploughing last year, and, and it is gaining interest uh, internationally. So it's great to see that the interaction that we're having with the college and, and the work that we're doing in the business is gaining good traction from both in Ireland and further afield. And we're even talking to our smart chick competitor in Belgium, and I have a, a conference call with him in the morning. So it's, it's amazing how these things work. Um, this is all taking place again, um, I suppose, why we're here today with the help of uh, Knowledge Transfer Ireland, with Enterprise Ireland, with DIT Hothouse, and DIT Agricultural Analytics Research Group. So in summary, and I think I've gone on a wee bit too long here, so I'm very sorry. Um, I believe using technology and the expertise within our third level institutions will help overcome some of the challenges that uh, we all face, such as Brexit, and uh, help us even to look beyond the UK. And I think that's very important, and particularly being a company on the, on the border. Um, in PE Services case, I've learned you're, you're never too small to innovate. Also embrace change, don't, don't fear it. And finally, very important is be clear on what you want to achieve commercially. Keep focused on this and keep watching the market and your competitors, it's very important. And ensure good open communication and keep a very close relationship with your academic partner. And as I've already said, in my experience, the key to this is the commercial interface and that will, that will lead to the success of it. So finally, again, I'd just like to thank uh, Knowledge Transfer Ireland, Enterprise Ireland, Robert and Kieran and DIT uh, for, for all their help all along. So thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks, Gillian. I think there's a couple of themes in there that we will be coming back to. I think you, you, you've pointed the way to, to some interesting things that we might talk about. Claire, you, you similarly had a, a need for some external expertise that you didn't have within your own company. Do you want to talk about your story? Yeah, um, I think my story, well, thanks for inviting us here today, I think my story reflects a lot of similarities uh, to, uh, to my previous speaker's stories. Um, it's, I suppose, how can a small business compete with international markets and how can we create something of value with IP that can be scaled up to something that's actually worthwhile so that we can be bigger than the sum of the individuals. Um, I'm a pharmacist and I started my first business around 17 years ago. I sold it six years ago and I was sort of starting from scratch again. Uh, three, four years ago, we set up a new company in ISO, a medical device company, and we did mainly OTC products for, for veterinary and for pharma. Uh, we, that's where my contacts and my knowledge was, so that's sort of where we stayed. Um, ideas normally come from people and not from corporations, and that's my reason why I think small businesses can compete with international, large, Johnson & Johnson type of corporations. Um, the only ceiling that you put on yourself is sort of self, is, is self imposed. Um, and there's nobody better than small businesses to see the markets driven need for a solution. 
I am not a philanthropist, I'm in business to make money, so there always has to be a market for what I want to do. Um, our product that, uh, that one of the girls in the, in, the, in the company basically came up with is, well, why isn't there an easy way to look at targeted treatment uh, to treat for worming in animals, for gastrointestinal worms in animals? And how do you have to send it to a lab? And by the time you send it to a lab, you've infected the rest of your animals, they've cross-contaminated. The animal is getting sicker and it's gonna cost better, more to, to treat them. So as, as my previous sort of speaker was dealing with inputs from farms, I'm basically dealing with the outputs at the other side of the tail. So um, we set up a company called Telenostics, and that was to basically digitally analyze the fecal by a burden in, in, in a fecal matter in, in, a, in farm animals and, and uh, then in humans. Why we started with veterinary is because there's actually not a legislative mechanism for medical devices in veterinary in Europe, and we knew once we had proof of concept, we could go to market and we could actually fund ourselves. Um, but what seemed to what we thought would be easy actually is pretty, it's a complicated product. We needed mechanical engineers, image acquisitions, telecommunications, IT guys, some physics people to develop algorithms to recognize the image, and then the parasitologists to do the clinical papers. And I think when we were speaking earlier on, to try to understand the university lingo was, a, was really difficult. I mean, there's MVPs and TRLs and MHRAs and CADs and LEOs and VRNs and DOEs, and I'm just interested in, in, in basically paying people and keeping my show on the road. So how do you integrate your normal business solutions with, with, um, with your day-to-day -day process? And you sort of have most people, and, I've had three companies and I have four kids, so like sort of seven kids and a load of people. I, I, I take my responsibilities as an employer seriously, so I want to ensure that I don't lose track of my P&L when I'm trying to do fancy things that will buy me nice things in the future. So, so it's, it's, it's how, do you, how do you actually stay grounded and how do you keep your eye on the, on the prize as such? So how do we compete and how are we scalable? And how do we get something that's protectable? So in, in, in our situation, we, have, we created this idea called Telenostics, which was a telecommunications diagnostic device to automate the fecal sampling. But it was everything then from preparation of a sample to an image acquisition to writing an algorithm, either locally or in the cloud, to recognize the image and then feed back to your iPhone so that you can uh, so you can treat the animal straight away. So it very much feeds in with Killians and you have a sort of to feed in with the whole herd health management thing and have a dashboard of information. And that fits very well with the European Medicines Agency and, and this prophylactic treatment and targeted treatment to prevent drug resistance um, in Europe. So we basically started with this idea and we approached Enterprise Ireland. I've, been really lucky in, in all my experience in business, Enterprise Ireland has been a sort of a key partner. And uh, I remember my first meeting with them, I thought it was really scary. And now I think I have around 10 of them on speed dial. So they, they, they sort of come like an extended member of your business. So we were lucky as Declan McGee from the Innovation Partnership. He put us in touch. We got our first feasibility study, which was it's a simple form, it takes around three hours to get and you get five grand, so what you think might be an idea, at least you can get a little bit of research. He put us in touch with UCD and again, we were really lucky, we met with Stacey Kelly, who's here today. She, she, um, she tried to put us in touch with the in investigators to help us on our complex project because to, I had no idea about engineering, my IT capacity is nil. So really, I'm a pharmacologist, pharmacist, so how did I get all these separate guys together and, and how UCD is a, is a town, how do I get them all working together? So basically Stacy was a really important part of that. Um, and then looking enough again through Enterprise Ireland, we got a very good uh, solicitor to help us with our IP negotiations with, with UCD. And actually that was the first time I had really dealt with uh, Knowledge Transfer Ireland because we used their model agreements to actually set that in place because I really didn't know exactly what I was doing, but the model agreements are super. So all the stuff that's in your pack and especially this form here, it's super because the information is already there. You don't need to be a genius. You can actually just 
use information that's, that's already put there. And, and it's free and it's cheap and it makes, makes things much easier to do. So, um, so then basically we got, we got the researchers. I remember the first day in, we met all these researchers. There was a couple of Russians, a couple of Germans. It was, like a, it was a very international body. And the word holistic, philanthropic, and blue sky research was mentioned. I had to leave the room and get a cup of coffee because it was really scary. I didn't understand how I could ever get this commercially to work. Um, so what we actually did in the end was we got, because uh, even the, the university departments were in separate buildings, geographically diverse from each other, and all their acronyms, nobody, the, the guys in the, in the engineering department had different acronyms than the guys in the, in the parasitology who had different departments. And the IT guys were completely off the wall altogether. I can understand that, what they were saying. So we got an entrepreneur in residence to actually base themselves up in UCD for, for basically 12 months. Uh, and she was, she was vital, really, to bring everything together. Um, and, um, yeah, and uh, the funding really is... You know, the funding is easy to get at an early stage if you have a very go good idea and you have proof of concept. Enterprise Ireland is, is absolutely super. We were lucky enough that there was a Smart Agri Award. There was a Horizon 2020 project in 2015-16, and we won, the, we won the whole Europe. It was a pan-European thing, and, and we won that outright. So that sort of set us up, and that was, um, that was, um, that was managed by CBEC. Um, and uh, then we started working with WIT and TSSG, which are the telecommunications guys from CBEC. So it was a whole diverse, diverse group of, of skills and, and, and trying to basically, uh, trying to navigate and, and, and navigate your way and your passage through the sort of complex or the simple idea that turns out to be a complex problem or product and then to try to bring it to commercialization. Um, I suppose the thing I would sort of say is that nobody cares more than you about your, your project. So you, especially in a small business, you don't have a huge amount of, of resources. So you do have to stay personally involved. But if you can, if you can access the, the, the likes of Knowledge Transfer Ireland, the, there's a huge amount of knowledge in in UCD, it's amazing. The people we've met in UCD are absolutely, absolutely super. Um, the 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 likes of Stacy and her team, they couldn't be more helpful. We now have grouped our IP solicitor, and, and yeah, it's very much a team. If we have a problem, we sort of work it out together, and, and they've been they've been great. So um, you really don't need to be an expert in everything, but you just n need to know where to find the information. That's my story. Thank you very much. And turning to you, John, you have, um, you come at it from a slightly different angle, larger company, multiple institutional inter interactions. Share with us. Yeah, um, I'm director of research at Cook Medical. Um, uh, Cook Medical is a, a US multinational company, um, two sites in Europe, one in Limerick, uh, uh, over west, if you know where that is, <laughs> and the other one in Denmark. But. Um, I guess I joined uh, Cook, I, I, I suppose going back a bit further, I got into, it's a medical device business. Um, uh, we uh, cater for a lot of different medical specialities. Cook is also a diverse company. Um, uh, it uh, has different divisions, pharmaca, uh, cell therapy, Regentech, uh, property, hotels, resorts. But the medical device business is the part of the, uh, the business that, that we serve. Um, I started um, in the medical devices through a startup Mednova. That startup got acquired by Abbott. Um, and then after Abbott acquired, acquired part of Guidant that Boston Scientific couldn't keep, they had basically duplicated everything that they had in the site that, that was based in Galway. So they, we, we shipped that all to the US, closed down the Galway site, and then I moved to um, uh, take up a role in R&D with uh, Cook Medical. Um, back then, there were... 16 engineers working on R&D, kind of lower level R&D. And uh, at the time, we kind of set out a kind of a vision for what we, what we wanted to become. Um, it wasn't, I suppose, the, what I'm saying to a lot of the people that are sitting down here, it wasn't, that wasn't a management or it wasn't led from the top that 
this vision was created. That was something that we felt that we could do and we, a vision for ourselves. And to do that, we said, look, there's a couple of things that we need to change. Because essentially, working within a multinational company, you're competing with other sites um, for the opportunities, as, as we, uh, we call them. Um, and to get more of that opportunity, and to become, we wanted to get up to a higher level of strategic importance within the, the role and to influence the company at a, at a higher level. So starting off from the R&D perspective, we set out two objectives. We wanted to be, develop better, better quality product, and we wanted to do it faster. Um, those are the two first objectives. And then the longer term goal then was to get into, from the move from the product development into the kind of core research um, role. All of this, what we said about doing, was on top of our day job. That's the way I describe it in terms of we're saying, this is a longer term vision, we're going to work towards this, because this creates a lot of opportunities for people, and it adds more value to the company, um, and we get seen from within the global uh, corporate organization we're trying to catch their attention to say that these guys are capable of doing more. So um, to get um, uh, better um, and faster, there's a few things we did, initiatives we, 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 we took on. So within our R&D cycle, um, we, the, the R&D cycle was kind of the same as all the other sites, as you would expect, but we said we need to get it faster. So there was kind of an iterative um, prototyping concept development phase that it ran in six-week cycles. Um, and Cook at the time were vertically integrated, so uh, everything, most of what they, um, the product, uh, all the components for the product they made were sourced in-house. They had all that capability. But that was one of the problems we identified in terms of that was the cause of why the cycle was so long. And sometimes within a global corporate organization, you are not seen as their customer within the vertical enterprise chain. They just say you're another colleague, you know what I mean? So they don't have to change the practice of the way they work. So what we did is we started looking at uh, sourcing um, supply chain partners here, indigenous supply chain partners here on the island. And we went out there, and I had known a lot of these people from past work experience. And what I presented to them was then is there's an opportunity here um, uh, in terms of if you change the way you deliver your service, because their lead times are similar to what we had experienced from our own in-house, but we needed to totally change how that operated. If you work with us in changing your systems of work and how you provide the service to us, we'll guarantee you, you get the business. That's the, the proposal that we went out with. And what we set out as the target, instead of that six week turnaround cycle, we said, we're setting a target of one week and whatever we need to do in terms of buying equipment, adding people, to be able to turn that around, um, uh, if you're prepared to commit to doing that, we'll guarantee you we got the business. So we ran that cycle. We, so how it happened was there was a big project up for grabs at corporate. Um, we got the chance to pitch for it. We went, I went out there. I pulled two project plans together. One, if we were forced to use our internal supply chain, and the second one is we're allowed to use the indigenous supply chain, and one was 50% shorter than the other. So, of course, uh, you know, you're, you're appealing to the corporate guys in terms of I can get the product faster, and, you know, we had built the reputation around the quality because we had built, you know, a very uh, deep... Uh, uh, understanding of the science behind the product we developed, and that was through some of the interaction with the academic institutions. That's where they came in. We leveraged the expertise that was out there. We had done a lot of direct funded work. We had done co-funded work through um, innovation partnerships. We had, in, through engaging with those, you develop your own skills, um, and we worked, um, I suppose, um, very directly within the programs that we had with the academic research providers, with all the different institutions that we worked with. We took real ownership because when we committed to doing a project, whatever scales from small, to, uh, and it starts with small scale programs, um, we had to deliver a result. That's because when you go back to corporate and say, I want to do more, well, if you haven't delivered the result, you don't get that second opportunity to do more or to scale it up. But going back to the, 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 the R&D then, in terms of, um, engaging the supply chain. That worked out very well for us. Like, um, we have partners, we, there, there are several of them. There were four or five at the time. One in particular did particularly well, Vista met up in Carrick and Shannon. Through the whole process, they added 200 jobs up there. But we, were, we didn't go to set, create 200 jobs there. What we did, went out to do was to create a fast, much faster R&D development cycle. So effectively, what we did in terms of we doubled the size of our R&D team, but they weren't on our books. They were in Vista met doing work in, they worked with our team in developing that new product, but we worked in very fast cycles. And eventually, we actually turned it around where we could turn, 
That cycle that was six days, we got it back to a week. We turned it around to two and three days. We got so fast to doing it. So from a corporate perspective, and from a, um, we got a lot of attention because they wanted to do all of the product development in Ireland because all of the business units said they could see it. The products were getting launched, but the quality then of the product, and that's speaking to the academic in, in, engagement in terms of the understanding of the, the, the one thing, let's say, in the medical devices, products are getting far more complex. And the kind of breadth of skills that you need are, is widening all of the time. And we don't have all of those in-house. That's one thing. And then the other thing we don't have in-house, we don't have all of the equipment and, that's available to the academics, like you know, if you go into their labs and see what they can do in characterization, we don't have the expertise or, or all of that equipment. We have some of it, we don't have it all. But by leveraging that, you know, when we go and do a program and we have all of those points of contact set up, the corporate guys see this and they see the quality of the product. One of the things that we did, we proposed that big pro program of work, they got 40% increase in the product sales on that new product in the first year. Like, you know, so that drew massive attention from the corporate perspective. Um, and then we started doing more ambitious programs of work where that was very much, those are programs that were directed are very much aligned with the current business or the current products within the company. Um, but we started broadening the vision then. Again, we weren't asked to do this. We, we, we did ask if we could go and do something. We got turned down and said, no, that's far too strategic. There's too much risk. Um, how do we protect the IP? How do we protect the confidentiality? So how we overcame that particular kickback that was, we said, okay, will you allow us to work on developing some of the manufacturing technology associated with? Yeah, no problem. Went off, did it, but it ended up that we ended up with product, new product technology. So then that opened the doors. Um, for us again. So now, um, so we grew the group, uh, the group grew from 16 people to 70 people, and then it, it's, we, it's, it's like a, a split in the stock. We set up a core research group, um, and, and that core research group was to look at even the more ambitious programs of work where we're looking at technology that currently didn't fit in with our current product ranges, that we're looking for new opportunity beyond that. And that's kind of um, where we're at at the moment. And, you know, it's been a kind of an eventful journey. It's been an awful lot of hard work from both sides with, and with the academic institutions. Like we've gone from smaller scale direct funded research to smaller scale co-funded research to larger scale programs like, and more diverse programs. And that brings its challenges then because you, you start to see a lot of the, I suppose, the system isn't perfect. We have a, uh, the one thing I'd say to people down there is like, there is absolutely no excuse for not engaging with academia. Um, we have a fantastic, breadth of expertise available and capability available out there. Um, spend time finding the right partner um, starting off. And then be wary, like, you know, when you scale up, there's problems with scale. If we look at the funding mechanisms, like, you know, the um, innovation partnership, brilliant system, like, you know, but we need innovation partnerships that allow bigger scale programs. Um, innovation partnership program, there's a 25% um, overhead that facilitates some of the administration of a program, and particularly bigger programs of work need more administration within the university system. But, you know, some of the other systems, we are also involved in SFI research centers through one of the spoke programs, um, uh, Curum. But the issue is if you're in through one of the co-partners, not through the core, your program, there's no overhead allowed for uh, managing the program. And that puts huge pressure on the academic institution then because you can't run programs without having some kind of administration and oversight and, uh, and project management. Well, you, you, um, you raise a very interesting um, issue there, John, and I think we, we, we often hear, and it's been fantastic to hear, I think, you know, your, your three um, sets of, of very diverse experiences and the positivity of working with research. And of course, we, we, of, we often hear the pressure of, well, there, there must be more. And your example was more, more better. Um, higher quality. Within, within, I think, the academic research, it, its system, it's let's do more, let's do more spin outs. And we were hearing about the numbers and, and the issues about quality earlier. Um, let's do more collaboration. And actually, I think you touched to a very good point. At some stage, there is um, a capacity issue um, yeah. within the, 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 the state research side, possibly as much as there's a capacity issue that, that we were hearing about within your, your, your own organisations, and perhaps that's something that longer term we need to look at. But I think what I'm hearing and gathering from, from all of you is that there has been that, that right kind of capacity and capability, very different in each of the three situations, 
that, that you have, have each been able to, to tap into. And Claire, there's something I'd be really interested to, to pick up um, with you. I, I think actually everybody's described complexity. I think in particular, you were talking about really engaging and that ability to, to, to access diverse research areas um, and, and skills, not just, not just the skills, but the disciplines outside of those that you're familiar with. And in the end, you decided the best way to, to manage that diversity was to work with an entrepreneur in residence. And I'm just wondering what brought you to that point of understanding that you needed that kind of individual? And then how did you find them? And, and what was the nature of that relationship with the institution? Started. The idea wasn't really our idea. UCD had an entrepreneur in residence when, when we started, and we found David Kavanagh was his name. He was actually a really good guy. He came from business, uh, knew how to navigate um, UCD, not only geographically because you get lost in the place, but how to find out uh, how to get something machined or 3D printed or how to bypass the queues that would take months to get something on a CMC machine, how, how to do all of these things, because really it is quite complicated. How do you actually uh, request another researcher with, because it's, it's, it's just not clear to outside business how everything works. So he was, and shortly after we started, he actually left, which was a shame, back to I think private, private business. But uh, so at that stage, uh, Trish McCohen, who basically this was her idea, she, she was working um, very much with all the, all the speciality functions and uh, she started basically spending three, four days a week up in UCD. And uh, they eventually gave her a desk up there and, and, and she got all the individual guys to really speak to each other and, and that really needed to be done at an early stage. Otherwise, they would all grow in their own area but, but never talk to each other. So, so I think that was really important and I think key to keeping the thing commercial and focused and with milestones and timelines. So we didn't run out of money and funds and we, we sort of kept an eye at the, uh, at, at the end goal. And that's interesting, the, the focus that you were talking about. And I think that's something that in a, in a different way you were also um, talking to Killian, wasn't it, in terms of the relationship that you, that you needed to have with, with the academics and the research providers. How did you manage that relationship? I suppose in our situation, again, go back to what I said, uh, we were very clear at the outset what, what we wanted to achieve. Um, and I suppose going back earlier and uh, some of the other speakers, we listened to what um, the expertise was and um, we also very much were very lucky with the IT Hothouse. And, and again, uh, I, I keep mentioning that, but that interaction with, uh, ha with the college, but having the commercial aspect of it, being able to bridge the two was, was very important. And uh, I think when, when we were going off track, Kieran helped pull us back. And when the researchers were going off track, helped pull us back. So, so we managed to keep a good, strong focus on what we were trying to achieve. And uh, I think it was very important though, to have uh, somebody there to keep, keep everybody operating, but still in all, allow everybody to be able to express what they wanted to achieve. And I suppose I have been involved in other uh, um, research where if you don't have that commercial side of things, it can branch off into other areas, and particularly other areas of research that become more interesting as the project moves on and then you lose complete focus and the whole thing falls apart and I suppose from my perspective uh, in, in business um, uh, going back to what Claire said at the end of the day we've we have to be able to meet the, the, the wages at the end of the week we have a lot of commitments and uh, there are a lot of challenges out there so anything that we undertake we undertake very seriously and uh, it's very important then that you know, we focus on making sure that it works. And it's very important that the partner that we're working with is committed to making it work also. And that's why that, that whole commercial bridge is very, very important, particularly from the business perspective. And I think results will come out of that if, if everybody remains focused. John, you, you um, had a, a very interesting tale to tell there in, in terms of basically the expansion of your business. The, um, the expansion of, of 
the R&D side of your business and also about um, the effects on the supply chain um, in the way in which you're externalizing your research um, and, 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 and working with, with, with the third level. Any other intangible benefits that um, you see out? Because often we, we look at these interactions and, and we can see that there might be immediately immediate skills application um, and possibly some new technology, intellectual property or know-how. But you're, you're touching on something much bigger there. Give us a sense of what those other intangibles might be. Yeah, well, uh, you know, that, that whole growth from um, 17 to uh, 70, the, there was, you know, particular points in there where we actually doubled the size of the R&D by winning some of the opportunistic um, product development or research and development projects um, within the, the, the global corporate um, um, perspective. But, you know, it's... The big, the real big win beyond that, like because that's still doing a kind of product development, which is very much applied to current technology that you have in house. But it's the moving outside of that then and getting to we're now, now we don't operate at all on a local basis. We're operating from a global direction and perspective, like you know. But that's based on you know we have the um, built a broad skill set. Um, our, our own skill set has developed a lot, but we have access then to all the skill sets across the different uh, research providers. Like, and that's that, and, and it's proving that model then to the corporate guys. They see we see that as kind of fundamental to the development of the business going forward. We see that it's only in its infancy. Like, and that's one thing here. Like, let's say, in terms of um, uh, from. Uh, the, there was an, a lot of discussion today about startups and spin outs, like, which is fantastic and they're great metrics, but don't forget sometimes about some of the potential is within the existing businesses that are here. And we don't want to kind of, what we're trying to avoid in terms of keeping the business relevant, like, you know, if you keep doing what you're doing today and using the technology that you have at your disposal today, you will be you will expire in 20 years. And you know, it's like the old foreign direct investment type companies came in, stayed 20 years and moved out. So we have to keep adding value as a site, you know, but in adding value, you're creating more value, you know. So um, that, that's the opportunity, but the whole um, access into the research um, centers within academia is very important. Um, another interesting one actually is, recently what we've done is we've started to um, collaborate in the research with our supply chain partners, where they put money on the table, we put money on the table, and it's matched with funding from, in this case, Enterprise Ireland. Like, you know, so where we see that they need the next generation, our next technologies we're working on need different technologies from a supply chain perspective. They're putting their money on the table to co-invest with that. They see that aligning, but we've, the, the big advantage of it is it cuts our cost in half, so it makes it even more attractive from a corporate perspective. But that's another starting point. Like, if you can, we're doing that within, let's say, the medical device business, but there's an opportunity that you could broaden that out across cross sectors, so that, you know, if you get somebody in different sectors, if you get four or five partners investing and you get funding, you know, with Enterprise R&D or SFI to match that, like developing a technology that's useful to both, particularly around manufacturing technologies. There's an opportunity for, from a very cost-effective method to go and do really ambitious things around manufacturing technology. Yep. You've all described um, a very bright, vibrant, I think, um, research and development community here, not just within academia, but within the businesses and the models that you've described to us. Obviously, it gets increasingly topical, and, and as Killian mentioned the B word, I'm just going to ask each of you uh, what your views are on the effect of, of Brexit on, on your businesses, and particularly, actually, on R&D in Ireland. John, would you like to go first? You're nodding. Yeah, um, it's interesting, you know, I call it the kind of evolution of kind of research initiatives that, and, uh, that we've been... So we started off working locally with our local... Uh, university, um, and we started then looking at the other possibilities with other partners on the island. We started, then moved off the island, and we, we, we have done some work in the UK. And, you know, it's, uh, it's absolutely amazing. Like, you know, the, 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 the stuff I didn't think, let's say, we've, there's the, we're a small nation, and relatively our budget is pretty small in terms of what's put into research here. Now we want more funding into research, into the academic institutions, absolutely it's necessary. But you know, the UK have a bigger budget, so in some cases they, well, they have 
the advantage of the scale and they have the history where they're 100 or 200 years working in a particular field. And we've had the ex that fortunate experience where we asked, well, we've been working on a technology. We went to the UK to get a second opinion in terms of we had a theory on how this was working and we weren't sure. We went to the UK, they threw a totally different theory and they proved that their theory was right but you know, in a very short space of time. But from a Brexit perspective, I'm re I see a lot of opportunity. We need to be able to collaborate, uh, kind of, well, from a European perspective, we've worked with universities in Germany around some particular applications. Um, and as you get more evolved, you'll start, I think we'll start doing more of that because we don't have all of the technology and all of the state-of-the-art equipment that's needed. When you're really at the cutting edge where you're down to mo uh, molecule and atom level of detail, um, you do need to reach out because there is expertise out there that can help you. Brexit is going to cause a huge issue because, well, it could potentially cause a huge issue if there's not something negotiated where we can keep that door open. There, we, our UK partners, we find them very good to work with. Like you know, We're really blown away by the capability and the expertise that's there too, and their willingness to work with we haven't done this yet with Irish institutions. We have proposed that to them, but, and they're very willing to do that. So, greater collaboration from, from your perspective, Claire? Um, I possibly think for Irish institutions there's a, there's really a, a, a really good opportunity. And I know from some of the some American people and business people we've been speaking about, they're, they're, they're slow about uh, investing in the UK. The, there's a new medical device directive in Europe and there's going to be a while before that's harmonized. It's really unclear how the UK are going to deal with all their regulatory affairs and how the European Medicines Agency is going to integrate with, I don't think anybody knows any of these answers. So when there is, uh, when there is levels of uncertainty, people don't invest. Um, and then we're the only English speaking country in Europe. So we really have to up our capacities to take advantage of that. And, and then work with the European partners when we're found lacking. Uh, there's, there's two universities in Belgium and Netherlands we've done a good bit of work with, and they're absolutely wonderful. Their English, in, in most instances, is much better than mine. Uh, and um, yeah, so it's just about, it's just about uh, I think there's, there's huge opportunity there, because the level of uncertainty and the amount of variables there are, are huge from regulatory. Opportunity for change then, Killian, and not because we don't like the uncertainty word, do we? No, we don't like uncertainty, but one thing we are certain is that the change, but uh, I think Brexit, um, Brexit obviously there's a lot of negatives there, and uh, being a business and grown up on the border down through the years, we, we've we been going over and back the border depending on currency fluctuations, so it's nothing new, and obviously any business that has, um, you know, people talk about the effect of Brexit, and the effect of Brexit was the day after the decision was made for, for a lot of companies, my own company included, because we were working with Enterprise Ireland quite a lot to increase jobs and increase exports. Of course, it was done going into Northern Ireland and into the UK, so, so there, there have been negatives in relation to that. I think the opportunity here really, particularly in the collaboration, why we're here today and talking about knowledge transfer. I think the technology piece, as I said earlier, is creates something new within the company and something new would it, would possibly within the industry as well. And forgetting about exchange rates and various different things like that, I think if you have something new that's going, you're offering customers, that's going to save them money, that's going to allow their businesses to be better, and it's going to give a, an overall improvement to the industry, I don't think Brexit is going to have an impact on that. People will want to have it from that perspective. But the other thing that Brexit is doing for, for us as a company, obviously, we, we have to rethink, we have to plan, um, is a strategy in terms of looking beyond the UK now. We're not just looking over the fence, we're looking over the other fence as well and further afield. And I mentioned uh, the, the Belgian company as well, um, that spun out of Leuven. Um, there's great opportunities there as well. And I suppose the journey I have been on has opened our minds as a company in terms of the opportunity and going back. If you do think small, you will be small. If you do think big, well, hopefully you will be big. But uh, you, you have to take that perspective. And that's why we're engaging with, with, this, uh, with, with this journey. And I think it's important that uh, you know, we, we see it through because there's, there is an opportunity in it. We'll have to deal with whatever Brexit throws at us. None of us have a crystal ball. None, none of us know what's going to happen. And I think at the end of the day, if we always keep in our minds change, I think we'll just try and work with it. Thank you. 
I'd like to throw it open to the floor now. Do we have any questions? Um, and believe me, the, the, the lights are quite fierce, so it's actually quite hard to see. There's one over there at the back, and a, there's a microphone making its way to you. Oh, hi. Um, for the proof of... Sorry, I've forgotten the girl's name there in the jacket. Um, the proof of concept... Um, for your product, what is involved with that, and what's the name of the program that's involved after the proof of concept with Enterprise Ireland? Thank you. Sorry, who are you asking that question? Sorry, the girl in the black trouser. Sorry. Claire. Claire. Sorry, I've forgotten your name. My apologies. So sorry. The question is, what's involved after the proof of concept? Yes. So basically, the and innovation. The name, of, the name of that program. The program, well, we, we, uh, we started with a feasibility study and went to an innovation partnership. The innovation partnership, really, the output of that was the proof of concept. Um, and then from the innovation partnership to where we are now is really the commercialization part, which we did in association with Enterprise Ireland. So I suppose it depends. Every project is different and your, your, your milestones are different. So I would think it sort of depends on the project. But... Um, Enterprise Ireland uh, really have pretty much, they have very good DAs and they can sort of work with you and reflect and give you funding mechanisms. It could be equity funding, it can be uh, what used to be called RTI funding, I'm not sure of the acronym now, but uh, uh, to, um, to, yeah, so that you can sort of keep the uh, venture capital funds at bay for a little bit longer until you really need them. Um, we've never really looked at VC funds because we've been approached at, by early stage by pharmaceutical companies. Um, the panacea for a pharmaceutical company is to be able to diagnose and treat. So um, after we had proof of concept, which was the innovation partnership, we then had Enterprise Ireland helped us on the commercialization scale. And, and now we're getting strategic investment from a pharma company to help us have the end product. Not sure if I answered your question. Yes, sir. thank you. Just one more question. On um, the proof of concept stage, is that a certain length of time required for that, or just whenever that's completed, or is there a certain time? It depends on, I suppose, what you're trying to prove. So um, from, from us, it was, it was that our actual, I suppose, proof of concept was that we actually had a valid pat patent and that we had enough raw data to show that actually the product worked. It didn't mean that everything was... Uh, was was sorted and everything was clear sailing from there, but it at least showed that we have we had a novel product that we had capacity and that we had some sort of white paper on some data set that we had proven. Yes, thank you, and good luck. It sounds like a great product. Good luck thank with you. that. Thank you. Thank you. And if you're interested in funding, if you're able to stay to the end of the meeting, we should be able to reveal something for you that might actually be quite helpful around that. Are there any other questions there in the audience? Yep. Good afternoon. I'd like, I'd like to compliment the three speakers, Claire Killian um, uh, and, sorry, John, John for, for a very informative talk. My name is Mary White. I'm from NSCI, your National Standards Authority. Claire, I have one question, just looking at your uh, biography there. Has ISO 13485 helped your business in becoming accredited? And I know you're working now towards the medical device directive, and there's going to be, with the directive, there's going to be changes in standards. Um, but has this enhanced your business? Yeah, I mean, ISO isn't really, uh, it's a prerequisite really to do business, in my opinion. We are now, we got a re accreditation to the new 2016 standard in January this year. Um, I remember when I started business first, and I was working for a uh, uh, sort of a small American feed company and I implemented ISO was 15 years ago and I remember thinking I'll never have to do that again but 15 years later it's it's you know it's a prerequisite to business it's not a it's not an advantage it controls it controls everything and um, yeah I, I think it's vital I think it's vital and if you're going to try to deal with international companies and much bigger you know, nearly all the companies we deal with are, are we're, we're micro towards them. And, and to be able to deal with them confidently, 
you have to have be independently accredited and to have the, the, have the checks and balances in place in a small company where resources and capacities are all, always an issue. You know, you have to have a policeman over your head thinking, God, we'll never survive that audit unless we do it properly. You know, so an ISO sort of gives you that, puts manners on you. Thank you. Are there any other questions out there? I think, I think that's a no, but if, oh yes there is, over there at the back, sorry. Uh, Kieran Fagan, uh, company is Vara. Um, I was wondering, a lot of companies would say that navigating the system in terms of determining where the most appropriate uh, expertise resides within the third level sector uh, remains a challenge. Now, I know KTI do a fantastic job in terms of show showcasing some of the technologies and the research capability that's available and a lot of the, uh, the technology gateway centers and the, the other research centers are doing a, a much improved job in terms of branding themselves and uh, showcasing what they do. But is that still a challenge on the industry side? Uh, do you still find that it's, it's very difficult to determine who can help me um, within the research world in Ireland? John, do you want to go first? Yeah, that's, uh, I'd have to agree, that's always a challenge. Um, uh, it, you have to spend a lot of time out there yourself, and you have to be comfortable with the partner that you're selecting. Like, even if you get a partner that's recommended, I'd still go and, now, I've learned that from hindsight, and then we've made all the mistakes, and, uh, you know, if I had the time back, I'd do things differently, sure. But, yeah, it's a, it's a big, uh, it, it's a challenge in terms of it takes time to do that. That's, that, but that, that's a process you have to go through and put effort into. Um, uh, we have in the past jumped with the first opportunity we've, we've got, and it's worked out for us, but, you know, you eventually get exposed to more and more of the experts through working and engaging, and, and then you find a better partner for the next program or a, a, a partner to collaborate with, with who you're already collaborating with, like, you know what I mean? So, but if you're starting off, it's a critical part in terms of finding that right partner to start with first, and it does take time, and you've, well, I think you've just got to go out there and meet as many as you can um, through that whole process. So there's a bit there about both being able to navigate that system, but actually I think the message coming through is it's like any relationship. You might be able to, to, to do a bit of dating, but if you want a serious relationship, you have to put some effort into it yourself, yes. and it, yep. it's both sides. I think the time for serious effort on behalf of ourselves, the panel here, has probably come to an end. Um, I'd really like to thank everybody uh, from the floor for their questions. Um, there will be time... Um, at the, the end of the summit to, to talk a little bit more with our speakers if you want to. But for now, I'd really just like to say a big thanks to you for, for sharing your experiences and certainly for keeping me infused that we're going in the right direction here in Ireland. Thank you all very much. Thank you.